Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Pingana's six monthly webinar for our Australian Equities Fund. My name is Damien Crowley, and I head up Pingana's sales and marketing teams. Today, Rhett Kessler is with me, the senior fund manager, and Rhett will be providing you with an update on the fund, which, given the recent market gyrations, I imagine is very timely for you and your clients. Rhett is going to speak for around 20 minutes and go through the presentation deck that you can see, and then he'll be available to answer any questions that you may have. You can submit questions online throughout throughout Rhett's talk, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll answer those questions at the end of the, of the formal presentation. Thank you, Rhett. All right, good. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for dialing in. Um, I'm going to break the presentation up into several sections. Um, first of all, I'm just going to do a quick rerun just to centre everybody on what we're trying to achieve. Then I'm going to talk about what we've done. Then I'm going to make some reporting season comments and general market comments. And then we'll do um, a couple of stock um, examples and an outlook statement uh, before taking any questions, which uh, I assume many of you will be writing in. So first and foremost, um, if we go to page one, to reiterate, we think that our mandate is to do our utmost to preserve capital in real Australian dollars. And secondly, to generate at least a reasonable return for the risk we've taken on, which we define as the risk-free rate plus 6%. In terms of the history, as many of you know, we turned 10 at um, the end of June 2018, and uh, we're very proud of our, our results. We've had 10 years of unbroken um, capital preservation, as well as an average of close to 11% return. Um, as you can see by that chart, uh, we've done substantially better than what we've set out to do. Now, there's no doubt that this current year, and these numbers are until the end of September, um, it started out potentially more challenging. But we think there's a lot going on um, that works in our favour, um, and I'm going to come to that in a few minutes. Downside protection has been good. The market volatility is finally starting to pick up. Uh, we've had a long period of very low volatility. And by volatility, that's a technical term. By volatility, I really mean the gyrations in the equity markets. There's been an enormous amount of liquidity coming into the market, both directly and via things called ETFs, exchange-traded funds, and a host of other intermediary vehicles, including listed investment companies. An astounding statistic um, which has become even more apparent recently, is that there are substantially more ETFs or exchange-traded funds listed on stock exchanges around the world. There are a lot more of those than actual listed stocks. So the tail is wagging the dog. The next page is something we think about a lot, and um, what I've been intrigued by is more recently there's been a, and this is a word I'm going to use a few times um, in this presentation, there's been a bifurcation in terms of the cycles. There's a number of different cycles going on, but there's no doubt that the gyrations of the last few days, a few weeks, have really impacted your high multiple market darling sexy growth stocks. Um, where I would put to you that you're currently in anxiety and between anxiety and denial on that chart. Um, I would put to you as well that the value stocks are following a totally different cycle in the, in the constant balance between fear and greed. Now, suffice to say that our portfolio is well, well and truly entrenched in the value portion of the market, not because we value investors, but because those are the stocks where, where, where investing has made sense. If we go to the next page, um, that explains why our cash levels are quite low, is we're finding a lot of opportunities um, in companies that are not market darlings and that don't have a sexy story, but are good fundamental cash generating businesses. And so we've deployed quite a bit of cash in that. We have taken a lot of money off the table in certain um, of our very, very high multiple stocks. So, and I've been speaking about this for a while. We've been constant sellers of CSL, ResMed, um, Bingo, um, and even Credit Corp at the higher levels. So we have recycled substantial funds out of what we call high multiple businesses 
um, where we need a bigger margin of safety for where the valuations are getting to um, in order to deploy them into better areas or otherwise keep them in cash. Our current cash levels are above 16%. I'm not going to spend much time on the slide. It is quite a busy slide, but I always like to conclude it in every presentation. And the reason is that at times of high market volatility or in times of high uncertainty, you absolutely need to know why you're investing in the business. Um, my dad always used to say, if you don't know exactly why you're there, you'll typically get shaken out at the, best, at the worst possible time. So our process is something we continuously think about, we continuously go back to. For every stock we invest in, we have um, a, an investment thesis that tells us how we're going to preserve capital, how we're going to make money. We understand um, the milestones against which we test that investment thesis, and we're constantly retesting it. So remember, if we don't think we can generate an after-tax cash earnings yield of at least 6%, growing to 10% in the near term, we don't want to be there. In terms of the long-term performance, uh, many of you have seen the slide before. It is a good track record um, in spite of things getting a bit crazy in the last period with um, a fortune, the weight of money forcing its way either directly or via ETFs into your high multiple market dialing or growth stocks. Now, reporting season update. Um, as I've already mentioned, it was volatile. Um, some of the aberrations or reactions to what we thought were fairly pedant, uh, pedestrian earnings um, were quite big. I found that, that's that um, second dot point, the 15 best performing stocks were up 17% on the back of only a 1.5% earnings upgrade. And they were already on 25 times earnings going in. So the market darlings got pushed even higher. Um, and we think that's the headwind that the market's facing at the moment. Um, I've spoken about at length in past presentations about how the ETFs or the machines or the quant managers are really driving the prices. Um, and what we're seeing at the moment is you know, when money comes in, it pushes the market higher. We haven't seen money come out in this latest iteration until recently, and you're seeing massive falls in the market darlings as a result of that. Now, a lot of people would also say, gee whiz, this is a really interesting period. You've got global um, geopolitical risk rising quite highly. You've got interest rates trending up. Um, you've got the threat of inflation coming. Domestically, we've had you know, a Labor government, sorry, not a Labor government, I hope that's not a Freudian slip, but we've had a change in the PM. Uh, we've got the ongoing Royal Commission and now the announcement of a Royal Commission in the aged care sector. Um, we've got the ACCC looking into electricity pricing. Um, and as always, what I get most worried about is when you have a lot of private equity looking at, um, at buying out companies, which usually indicates that um, that, that euphoria is, is very high. So you've had a couple of bids for MYB, for Navitas, for Green Cross, um, Amco and Bemis was a very big transaction in the listed space, and Transurban raised another $4 billion at um, what we consider to be very, very high prices. Can I just say, it's always interesting, right? That's what makes the market. In the 25 odd years I've been in this uh, industry, I've never had a time when people haven't said it not interesting if it's not um, if it's not the Greek banking con uh, um, crisis or the Italian debt crisis or the trade war um, it's something else and it's just that's that's what we live through um, can I just stress that at all times there's a price for everything and people unfortunately even made money during the Second World War if I go to the next page, page we're looking at, you know, when we went into August, which seems like a lifetime ago now, we observed quite a big bifurcation of the market. Um, so going into August, we observed a bifurcation in the market. Relative boring stocks were limited at 12 to 14 PEs, but if you had a charismatic, sexy, technology-based story, there was no limit 
to the multiple that your stock was uh, ascribed. Um, in fact, one fund manager, it wasn't me unfortunately, because I thought it was quite clever, but even came up with a variation of GARP, which stands for growth at reasonable price, into GOSP, which is growth at a silly price. And as we've seen, um, we've got the um, bubble bucket, which is the next page, um, which we've come up with. And what we've done here is we've attempted to take a list of companies um, that are quite topical at the moment. A lot of them are in our portfolio. And let me just stress that that dotted line below um, 15 multiple is where all our companies reside. Um, and then you've got this host of companies, which, and this is probably out of date because it's three weeks old, but you've got a host of companies um, that, that stand way above that price earnings multiple of 15. We've even had to create a special um, section for the 100 plus club, where Afterpay, WiseTech, and Nanasonics, um, if we, you know, we had to abbreviate the, uh, the multiples, sit right above that. Now, let me just reiterate that a normal multiple is somewhere between maybe 14 and 20 times. In the good old days, if something was expensive, it was considered you know, 16, 17, even 20 times. It was really expensive. But we seem to have disconnected from that to some extent. And this is really, really concerning. Now, at first we thought maybe we're getting old and grumpy, and so we reran our numbers and we put in our best case scenarios. And if we weren't getting to the share price in terms of the valuations by 10 or 15%, I would say, well, maybe we're old and grumpy and too conservative. But the fact that we couldn't get there by 50 to 70% tells us that maybe something else is happening. Either this time it's different or um, prices are unsustainable. And so we have retained our discipline and stayed away from those. Um, I will come back and talk about CSL in a little while, um, but suffice to say that we've sold substantially, a substantial portion of our CSL holdings into those, those very, very ritzy prices. Now, our portfolio makes up this very boring section below the dotted line. And the average portfolio PE or price to earnings ratio of our portfolio is 14 and a half times. And this is the bifurcation that we're talking about. Now, believe me, when the market is racing ahead, as we've seen in the last 12 months until it came to a you know, grinding halt um, and downward, downward trend um, several weeks ago, the amount of discipline we need to retain in times of like this is enormous. Uh, because you keep thinking maybe this time it's different are we doing something wrong? And so we've been doing, probably never worked as hard, trying to reassess whether our investment thesis is on a faulty or whether they're correct. Um, and what we've seen of late is the amount of money that's been in those areas is starting to filter its way out um, and back into the bits below the line. Um, still early days, but, um, but, but we're sticking to our discipline. If we go to the next page, um, this is maybe another way to show it. And look, this has been done by, by people far cleverer than I am. I don't normally do this kind of um, growth versus value because I don't think that way. But what people have pulled out is they've said, look at the performance of growth versus value. And a growth stock is something with you know high earnings growth and a high multiple and a couple of other characteristics. Um, and as you can see, the, the bifurcation has been enormous. What's even more interesting is that if you look at the difference in that chart below, that blue dotted line is the, um, the difference between growth and um, on a relative basis, I hate saying the word relative, re uh, value versus growth has never been, uh, has, has seldom been wider than this. So we think that elastic band is really stretched. Now this is all macro. At the end of the day, what we do it is, is as an additional check to make sure that what we're doing seems reasonable and sane when um, hopefully you know, we, sometimes we think there aren't enough straitjackets for everybody else, so maybe we need them. But at, at points like this, we have to reiterate um, our investment thesis. So what are the things that we're really worrying about, really worrying about? And I thought I'd just put up a couple of charts um, to share some of our findings. The first one is we're concerned about the potential for inflation. Now, a lot of people think that you know, interest rates aren't going to go up. Um, particularly in Australia, you know, if we're so worried about um, an overheated economy, surely, you know, that's, that, that means that inflation will come back. 
But essentially, we've been looking at this for a long time, and we've been wrong for a long time about whether inflation comes back or not. And inflation for us is really important because it's what really destroys your ability to create financial independence because the value of your money starts to deteriorate. So when I look at wage growth, which has been very, very low for a long time, we're starting to see signs of it picking up, particularly the chart on the right, which shows um, AI group wages measures. Now, there's a the think tank that's done all this work. Um, they've alerted us to the fact. Now, now, there are two things here that I want to stress in every single chart I show to you. And that is, I put them all over exactly the time, same time period. And what I've noticed is two things. First and foremost, since about 2011, we have had a downward trend in all the charts I'm going to show you. Now, what that means is that you've had a tailwind for pressures keeping inflation low. Now, I would put to you that even if those tailwinds just stopped, that would be a significant delta. But instead, as this always happens with these things, is we're not seeing a tailwind just stop. What we're seeing is a kind of a V, where not only do you get the delta of tailwind not being there anymore, but you're starting to get a headwind. And I cannot stress this enough. You know, long-term averages arise for a reason. And if you've been significantly below the long-term average in terms of inflation, then sometimes you have to get back to it. And the only way to get back to it is by moving above. Now, I'm not trying to be, you know, calling out a catastrophe that inflation is suddenly going to jump, you know, to unsustainable levels. What I am saying is that there is a chance that in 12 months' time or 18 months' time, we could look back and find ourselves at least a full percentage point higher in terms of inflation. And the impact of that on the general economy and interest rates and purchasing power and everything is quite substantial. So this is the first one is wages. If we flip to the next chart, here you've got two things working together to create much higher fuel prices, petrol pump prices. The first one is the oil price has gone up, mainly due to geopolitical risk. And the second one is that our Aussie dollar has gone down. I'm talking about recently. But again, if you look back to 2011 or thereabouts, you'll see the downward trend for some time. So that means, you know, why is petrol prices such an important barometer for us? It's because it's a daily reminder, it's a daily impost on the consumer of his everyday life that his cost of living is going up every time he fills up. If we flick to the next one, the ones I want to focus on here, I mean, spare capacity I find a bit ephemeral, like it's quite hard to work out, but you see a similar trend. The important one is interest rates. Now I've said to you many times, if I could go back with one magic bullet, is I would love interest rates. Well, after I've taken all my money out the market, I would love interest rates to go back up to 19% like they were in the early 1990s or the mid-1990s. I would then take all my money after the carnage has resolved itself and put it back into the market and then go to the beach for the next 10 years as the Reserve Bank brings interest rates back down to 1.5%. Because that is the tailwind we've had for value creation in long duration assets. So you can see we've had a long trend coming down of interest rates and they're just starting to turn up. Just starting. And a lot of these are out of cycle interest rates where the banks um, have been forced to increase interest rates not because the Reserve Bank has forced them to, but rather because of globalization pressures where interest rates around the world are starting to go up. And remember that 40% of our funding comes from offshore. All right, that's enough of the macro stuff. Um, how do we do in the quarter? Look, it was a good quarter. It was a little volatile, but it was a good quarter. Uh, we finished up, up two, and, two and a bit percent, which if you're trying to do 8% per annum, is, uh, or seven and a half is, is a good number. Um, our cash levels um, are slightly higher now than they were at the end of September, um, but certainly focused, our equity investments are focused in, in low multiple businesses. What did we do? Well, we had a very, very active quarter. And as I say, you know, our investment process has been quite disciplined. Um, we've sold a lot of, um, so what have we, we, we I'm going to start with what we sold, the bottom line. 
We've sold out our holding in there. We've sold Credit Corp. We've sold, or well, not all of it, but, but a big chunk of it. We've sold a big chunk of our ResMed. We've sold an even bigger chunk of CSL. And with Bingo, you know, as always, you need a little bit of luck. And I like the name Bingo, but uh, we did get a big allocation of stock in the last placement at substantially below the share price. We then saw a significant lift in the share price, taking our holding to well over 4.5% of the fund. And we have reduced that into some really nice strength just before the latest fall um, because the after-tax cash earnings yield got too thin. So we've been very, very active in selling stocks. Where we applied money, look, um, our biggest buy has been Viva Energy, where we haven't covered ourselves in glory. Uh, we think it's a very solid business trading on lower than 10 times um, uh, earnings multiple, and that translates into at least 10% after tax cash earnings yield. Um, and we've, we started new holding in Platinum Asset Management. Um, as you can see from the major contributors, the, the credit corps, the Telstra's, the Bingo's, the ResMed's were our major contributors. And so we did take advantage of very strong share prices to sell into them. Um, with um, the detractors being you know, our new acquisition, Viva Energy, um, Westpac, and Flight Center. So how's the portfolio configured at the moment? Well, as always, defensives make up our biggest single um, sector exposure. Um, and Viva Energy has entered into our top 10. Um, um, financials make up our second biggest consumer discretionary was up at 14%. We are concerned about the impact of high interest rates and, um, and high fuel prices on consumer spending uh, because their disposable income is lower. So we have trimmed those substantially. Um, this is another chart that I don't normally share. Um, Mark uh, Christensen put it in. As you know, I don't generally look at these kind of things, but it is fascinating, so I've left it in. The average multiple for industrials and financials is 21.2 times. This is three weeks old. This is very, very high and carried very high by a lot of, um, a lot of stocks that, um, that we think are overpriced. Okay, stock examples. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. So I'm going to go through these quite quickly. Happy to come back to them. Woolworths, we think, is a great business. And can I just say that it's a great inflation hedge. If you think inflation is going to go up, and we've started to see a big sharp increase in fresh food inflation, and I would always take the point that it's quite volatile. But remember that Woolworths is a scale business if you move the same amount of boxes but for more money, then you make more money. And we've always considered it to be a very, very strong inflation hedge. We think management's doing a great job. And you can see um, we've been quite active in that business on the, on the um, share price line. Bingo, I guess, um, I've spoken about at length in the last webinar. I would just put up uh, how active we've been in our, um, in, our, in, our, in our positioning of that stock. And... You will look at our two big acquisitions of late. They've both been below market due to placements. Um, CSL, I'm sure I'm going to get lots of questions on, so I left it there, um, but also just wanted to show in terms of the... So I can come back to it if, if anyone asks a question about it. I've got all my detail there, but I just thought I'd also just demonstrate how active we've been in, in, uh, in this business. I'd like to finish off then on the outlook. And I really just want to summarize a lot of what we've said before. First and foremost, the domestic economy remains underpinned by full employment, and I did put full with a capital for a reason, and a weak Australian dollar. And the way we think about this is that your, other than retail and healthcare, the high employment arenas are things like tourism, education, agriculture which are underpinned by a weak Australian dollar. Secondly, consumers are facing a number of headwinds, including rising petrol prices, higher out-of-cycle interest rates, and let's not forget falling house prices, which we think will impact on the wealth effect. Now, the conundrum of full employment playing off against falling house prices is something we're watching very, very carefully. Paradoxically, 
in spite of the headwinds that the consumer is facing. Many inflationary indicators are trending upwards, as I demonstrated to you. And that's got us on alert. So we're watching that. And how are we positioning the portfolio? I'm fairly consistent with the way we've done in the past. We're avoiding the bubble bucket as valuations are especially vulnerable, as we've seen of late. We're retaining the focus on resilient business models, supplying essentials, so everyday toilet paper and toothpaste type things. So think, you know, CSLs, plasma, ResMed, sleep apnea, health insurance, petrol, um, groceries, um, and the like. And with those companies have got real pricing power. The average multiple of our portfolio is about 14 and a half times. The average after tax cash earnings yield is close on 7% one year forward. Um, the average balance sheet of the portfolio is very, very comfortable, uh, if not excess cash. Um, and we've had detailed conversations with all our company CEOs and CFOs. Um, most of them are very conservative operators. Um, and that's why we like them. Um, they typically under-promise and over-deliver. Um, and we like the way they position their businesses and their balance sheets um, for the next few years. So that's a fairly uh, comprehensive um, view on our outlook. Um, as always, we think it's going to be interesting as things evolve, uh, but we think we're very well positioned going forward. Um, given that we've worn the pain of these very high growth stocks being pushed higher and higher, and now coming back to earth with a bit of a thumb. So on that basis, I'll now throw it open to um, questions and to the moderator, Damien. Thanks, Red. Um, we've got a couple of questions that are coming through. Uh, Should I just go through them? Yeah, maybe we can okay. go through them. Yeah, so maybe the first yeah, question is, is, I always like to start off with an easy question. Are we going to email up the slides afterwards? Uh, the answer is yes. yes. So please, you'll all get them um, and comfortable in, um, in, in um, you referring any additional questions back to Damien um, on the back of them. Um, Apologise, Mark, that you can't see the slides. Um, hopefully, you can see them now. Um, the next question is, we had a Labor government under Turnbull, not net, um, we had a Labor government, um, so I'm not sure about the question, um, but, but let me just raise the issue of how does the change in government or potential change in government um, affect business, uh, affect um, the economy? We don't, we don't think it'll help investor sentiment because if there is a change, it'll be a change away from what's supposed to be business friendly to labor friendly. Um, but we think that's already factored in. In addition, it's creating quite a few opportunities. Uh, we think in the health insurance area, where the stocks have been slammed down, uh, we, we trimmed our, our holdings substantially at much higher prices and have been adding to them since then. Again, long-term good resilient businesses exist for a reason and a value proposition. And we like this kind of negative noise because it creates opportunity. Um, the next question um, that why do we think SIQ was being shorted? Uh, look, there are a lot of stocks being shorted. Um, I know that it's not a very liquid company. I, I understand that some people think, well, one of their major earning streams is novated leases and therefore the sale of new vehicles. We know that the fall in the um, numbers of, of new vehicles being sold is a reflection of some of the toughness um, the consumers are experiencing out there. Um, SIQ is actually counter-cyclical in that respect. So if it was being shorted for that reason, um, we think it's, it's the wrong reason. Um, and, because, and I'll just explain that. So Novated Lease is a way of financing a new car. If you're already on a Novated Lease, you typically um, don't get, or you definitely don't get the value from selling a car to allow you to buy a new car independent of the Novated Lease. So they have about a 70% releasing uh, ability. When you've already got 65,000 vehicles in your innovative lease, average of three years, it does mean that you, you will average you know, just under 20,000 
new vehicles being leased, and that's where the money's made. So it's a it's a remarkably resilient business. Um, and and I have been hearing, I have been broke to that people were selling. They thought it was might be a good short idea because because of the weakness in new car sales. Um, next question is very very relevant. Um, it says banks seem to have become a value trap. Could you uh, kindly address the holdings here, please? So we currently have two um, major holdings in the banks, ANZ and Westpac. And as I've said in the past, is that if we think that the Royal Commission is the reason why the prices of the banks or the multiples of the banks are so low. Um, we might be caught in a real value trap because it may turn out that in five years' time, the profitability of your residential mortgage book is substantially lower. And that's the real reason why, um, why share prices are headed lower. Now, there's no doubt that, that there's one overriding factor that's happened in the last few months and that banks are seen as a source of liquidity. And um, I'm always surprised by how counters... Um, indicators they are to, to resources. So in other words, big fund managers who have long only index hiding portfolios essentially play banks off against resources because that's where the liquidity is. And so you've seen quite a bit of that whiplash backwards and forwards. But the main question not to be distracted is, are they a value trap or not? Now we've done a lot of work on this. We remain convinced that banks are good businesses with substantial market power because they control the price of money and they control the funding to be able to lend at the levels that is required in this economy. And therefore, they are an essential part of the Australian economy. There's no doubt that they've had some substantial ancillary businesses that were, sorry, not substantial, but lots of small businesses that were very, very substantially profitable trimmed away from them. So if you think Forex, you think um, uh, general insurance, you think... Um, motor vehicle financing, et cetera. That's created its own opportunities in other parts of the economy. But the banks are now essentially residential mortgage books and business lending books. And we think they're an essential pillar of the economy. We also expect that um, the biggest issue the Reserve Bank has now is making sure that the deflation in house prices is, um, is orderly. And as a result, Going too hard in the banks would be disastrous for this economy. So from a political perspective, we think the elastic band is stretched as far as it can. Underlying that, um, another uh, lever they've got to pull is substantially lower operating costs. And ANZ has made exceptional progress on that, and we think it's got a lot more, and so is Westpac. And that's why those are our two positions. Do we have a view on the resources sector is the next question. Um, we have a number of views on the resource sector. I mean, the main one while we're not there is because we can't predict future iron ore prices or oil prices um, with any certainty so that we can preserve capital. Uh, frankly, we don't think anyone can, but, but we certainly can't, so we stay away from it. Secondly, um, the risk inherent in resources due to geopolitical risks, particularly given economic activity in China, is at a level where we can only hazard a guess at how this develops over the next six to 18 months. And as you know, if we don't know, we don't play. Uh, Caltex has been on a downward slide of late with price. Do you remain optimistic about it? Um, yes, we do, um, and for a number of reasons. There's no doubt that the headwind of higher oil prices filters through to slightly lower demand, very inelastic uh, product, but slightly lower demand. And more importantly, people tend to trade down from premium where they make a lot, lot more profit per liter to, to standard fuels. Um, and we've seen that happen. Um, so if anything, uh, we think that that potential profitability here has bottomed at this level. As you know, we were as surprised as everyone when Woolworths uh, tried to walk away from the agreement by selling the business. Um, we think Caltech's management has resolved that quite well. Um, and we think that from these levels, profitability will improve. Remember that we have exposure not only to Caltech, but to Viva Energy and Z Energy. And um, in hindsight, having an exposure to 
an industry that would be in the short term negatively affected by um, by rising oil prices um, was incorrect. But at these levels, we think that's well and truly in the price. Um, the after-tax cash earnings yields are sensational, um, and we're certainly getting paid in spades to be there. Um, I will also just point out that the CFO of Caltex uh, resigned this morning, um, and so there will be some changes there. Um, another question which I think I've answered, but I'll just go through the, the whole question is, um, we'd be interested to get our views on the outlook of resources over the next 12 months. Do you see us returning to the boom times we saw in the early 2000s, or will the trade war crimp out growth potential? Uh, growth potential? So maybe what's useful here is just to give you a number of the different component parts. The economic cycle has been quite extended, uh, particularly in the US where it started a while ago. And low interest rates have certainly feel that. We have interest rates going up. We have a trade war. We have India on the positive side emerging with very strong growth. Um, and so there's a lot of variables floating around. To be frank, we don't for one moment think that we are experts or have the expertise to guess what is going to happen with the resource boom going forward. And as we've always admitted, we tend to, we always focus on where we have high degrees of certainty, which is you know, consumable, non-discretionary, um, or business non-discretionary, or businesses with enormous power where they can um, um, in, in, entrench their ability to, to continue to earn superior returns. So I'm gonna, I am gonna duck that question because I just think there are too many variables. Um, the next question is, um, and thank you for this one, uh, my, my team and I have been going through this in, in enormous detail, but if the question is, could you talk a little more about Viva Energy and the underlying investment thesis, please? Yes. So Viva Energy, um, we, we were a um, significant investor in the in the company from from the from its first listing. Um, the share price has fallen just over 10% since we acquired our position, um, and we have not received a dividend since we invested, which is just a couple of months. So essentially, we're down 10%. The the main investment thesis behind this investment is the fact that it is um, it has three businesses. One of them is a refinery down in Geelong, which accounts for approximately 45% of the earnings. Um, that business is doing extremely well. Um, and in fact, will make up for some of the um, reduction in earnings in the other two businesses um, in, in quite a good way. The second business is it is the uh, sole retail, uh, sole wholesale supplier of fuel to Shell pet petrol stations which uh, trade under the Coles banner, or to Coles petrol stations, which trade under the Shell banner. Um, they have a very strong agreement there where they can unilaterally set the wholesale price to, to Coles. Very unusual arrangement. Um, Shell and them have been waging a war of attrition, uh, well, mainly from uh, Coles' point of view, where because the wholesale cost per litre has gone up, uh, Coles have put their pump price up and um, made up for the loss in the wholesale price through a higher retail price. This is effective volumes at the same time that they've been under pressure from higher fuel prices generally across the industry. And therefore, the, the earnings for Viva from the Coles petrol distribution network would be under pressure. Remember, though, that Viva also supplies to a host of independents, and therefore significant volume has gone to the independents who are trading at lower prices, well, lower pump prices. The third business is a very, very successful jet fuel and cruise liner um, commercial supply arrangements, where they are one of the two biggest in Australia. Um, we're never quite sure if they're the biggest or not, but they certainly have market power in that industry and demand there has gone up substantially. So we see you know, three out of the four businesses doing very well, but offset by you know, one of the big businesses which is supplying um, coals with, with, with fuel. Um, generally around the world, um, surprisingly, refineries have done exceptionally well. There's some regulatory changes 
which, which is very, very good for the profitability of refineries. That has been reflected in, in prices around the world, but not domestically. Uh, we think that's yet to come when we see the numbers. So um, the investment thesis in terms of our after-tax cash earnings yield has gone got even better. We have nibbled at some more shares, uh, but conscious of the fact that we face a headwind with higher oil prices. Um, we remain exceptionally confident in this business. Those are the questions I can see on my screen to date. Um, I might just waffle on for a few minutes in case anybody else wants to put another question up. Um, I do think that we are well positioned uh, going forward. Uh, we've got a very good Um, sorry, another question's come up which which I don't uh, I don't understand, and um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to deal with. So so if that person can just maybe um, refine that question, that'd be good. Um, but I do um, I did want to say that that we think the portfolio is exceptionally well positioned, um, and we've got a high caliber, good quality, well priced. Um, portfolio of, of companies at very, very good after-tax cash earnings yield. Um, then I've just had two questions, which are quite major questions. We have got enough time, so I'll go through them. Uh, the first one is, um, are you really positive about CSL going forward? Can I say that there are very few companies, and, and I'm very conscious of the fact that you never want to fall in love with a company, but there are very few companies that have simultaneously invested so much money in expanding the capacity of their throughput. So in other words, built out the ability to fractionate plasma for high-end products across the globe, built out the ability to expand their collection centers, and made investments in very high growth countries like China and other Southeast Asian countries, while simultaneously substantially growing their after-tax cash flows and their earnings at double-digit levels. In addition to that, their ability to make these investments puts them several years, if not a decade, ahead of the competition because these by the time you've built the plant and got FDA approvals to build these kind of plants, um, it, it takes five to six years. CSL is substantially ahead of an industry where it is already the lowest cost provider and the highest margin producer because of its speciality products. Now, there's no doubt that the multiple got really high. Even if you value their vaccination business properly, which we think we've done, um, and that's why we took a lot of money off the table, but we still have a significant investment in it because we're still very comfortable on it. Um, a view on Telstra, please. Look, we think that this um, enormous uh, issue about the fact that senior management are still getting paid big bonuses um, is, is unpleasant, um, and, and it must really stick in everybody's crawl when, when the share price has gone down as much as it has. I think it's a necessary evil. We for a long time have had a view that Telstra has to take the gloves off. And in order to take the gloves off, they have to have a belly in their, a belly in their earnings going forward. And as a result of that, you need to free management up to make those steps. It still sticks in my crawl to pay them you know, that amount of money. I still always think that if you paid them half that, they would still do the job. And, and we've been quite vocal about that. Um, do I have an opinion on course? No, I don't. That's an easy one. Um, do you have uh, car sales and web in your portfolio? And if not, why? Those two are firmly in the bubble bucket. And we've looked at them. We've done enormous amounts of work, particularly on car sales. I think it's a great business. Um, and we think it's quite resilient. Um, but when you pay multiples even higher than the highest bubble bucket for one of your major investments, uh, we think we can afford to wait to see if it works or not. Um, 
Another Telstra question is how we currently view Telstra's prospects for the challenge posed by the new entrants, such as TPG. Look, we think Telstra is a very uh, good marketing organization. Um, in spite of uh, media's best efforts to, to downplay their marketing accomplishments, we think they've done a great job. Remember that they still have a price premium um, and they still have market share growing, even in the NBN where it's a level playing ground. So we think it's a good business. We think the changes are enormous um, and therefore the risk is quite high. Um, and we will manage our position at, at, at an acceptable level. So um, you know, we've, we've, we've received big dividends. We've had a big bounce off a level where we bought some more stock. Um, we've certainly taken a bit off the top, but, um, but we've still got an, a decent holding because we think the prospects, particularly in a product that has become the new oxygen, um, we're just waiting for better monetization models. Remember that stock's on, a, on approximately a 10 or 11 multiple, uh, particularly when you strip out the um, when you strip out the um, government bonds with the NBM payments. Um, sorry, and 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 uh, the question has come back. So, so when Caltex had a refinery at Cornell, um, the the business was seen as as a good refining business, but but very volatile. Uh, when they converted the refinery into a terminal, um, the share price went up and, and, and it was a better business. We still think it's a much better business, but the fuel industry, because of rising fuel prices, has, um, has created some issues. Um, in addition, the bit of unknown information about Caltex was that they had that weak agreement with Woolworths where Woolworths could uh, sell their, uh, if they sold the business, then they would lose the, the supply arrangement. Uh, that was the bit of new information that's really impacted on the share price. Um, we think it's a very good organization. I've been asked to comment on some retail stocks. Uh, we've had a look at Levisa. Um, it is one of those very high multiple businesses that's currently got an international ro uh, rollout story um, uh, with quite a bit of risk. We think that if you buy the shares of these multiples, um, there's no margin for error, so that's why we've avoided it. Uh, we think management's superb. Um, is that the whole question? Um, there's another question, which I guess is a more um, distribution question, which I might just give myself a rest throw to Damien, uh, which is, do you hold the, um, are we, can you hold us through the new investment? Oh, sorry, it's not a distribution question, sorry. Let me, let me, I retract that. The question is, um, do we hold the new investment platforms uh, in terms of Hub, OneView, and NetWell? No, we don't. Um, and I'm getting a bit tired of, I guess, um, I'm sure you guys are getting a bit tired of me saying the same thing, but you know, on a disciplined basis, we cannot get there on the multiples. So after tax cash earnings yields are sub 2%, and which means they have to triple, and, and they might, um, we're not saying they won't, um, but they might have to triple in order to, to get there. We think, we know they, they, they give a lot better service, and we know that for some time they've been a lot cheaper. I'm not sure how the panorama response on price will affect their, um, their attractiveness, but, but it's a very competitive environment, um, and some of the big boys are not gonna take this lying down, and certainly the dragons have been poked um, and then they're up and screaming. They, they may have lost all credibility, but they certainly will come back fighting. And, and it's just when you're buying stocks on 40 or 60 PE multiples, um, it's really, really hard to, um, to try and preserve capital by holding them. Um, because, you know, and can I just reiterate, my, my main concern is that I don't have the expertise to know that if something's on a 40 multiple, for whatever reason you think is valid, I don't know if it should be on a 45 or a 35 times multiple. I think the, the, the variations are just too enormous. And you're really playing, um, you're playing flows of you know, the last incremental buyers for those stocks. You may be right, and, and they're very smart guys who, who, who do this exceptionally well, who, um, who, who may know when to get out and when to get in, um, but we're not, we're not smart enough to do that. Um, so I might finish on the last question, which I think is a very, very insightful one, and without giving away, too much away, it's been one of our views on Lend-Lease. The multiples are not excessive. Uh, we've spent a lot of time with Lend-Lease management. 
uh, very impressed by them. Um, we don't like the engineering business, so you know, stuffing up on North Connects or, or, or the like is never a good thing. Uh, but we think that it is completely manageable within the multiples ascribed to the other businesses. And so when you pick it apart, um, and, and we're still you know, in the middle of doing this, and it looks like a very, very, uh, very, very good business. So if I, can, if I can round off, we are extremely excited by the opportunities finally being presented to us. We are reopening a lot of new files on stocks that are finally coming back down to earth. Um, and, and very optimistic, um, which I know is, is, is probably quite non-consensus, <laughs> but you know us, we, we, we don't like robust euphoric times. We really like uh, a bit of panic and a bit of blood on the streets, which um, I suspect there'll be, there'll be quite a bit more of this month. So thank you very much for your attention um, and for your support. And... Um, and uh, we look forward to, um, to further communications. Thanks. Thanks, Rhett, and thanks, everyone, um, for joining us, as Rhett said. Hope you found the session valuable for yourselves, but also, obviously, to assist with your client communications. Um, and as I referred to earlier, we'll send you the presentation uh, and the recording probably early next week, I would think. But, uh, but yeah, thanks again, and have a good day. Thank you.